Little girls have dreamed of being princesses as long as there have been fairy tales. Thanks to Hans Christian Andersen, I myself had a slightly off-kilter fantasy of growing up to be a mermaid. But if I wanted to dress up as a mermaid for Halloween, or to paddle around in my friend's plastic pool, I needed to create my own tale, so to speak. Like all former kids who are now today's parents, my fantasies came directly from my own imagination, evolving naturally from my interests, taking me into realms I chose to explore through play. But for 21st century kids, kids who live and breathe princesses, brats, dolls, and transformers, things are very different when it comes to what they play with, how they play, and what they wear. If you've got a daughter who can walk and talk, you've likely had at least a few conversations and some strong disagreements about her choice of clothes. There's nothing new about any of this. It's the job of every generation to attempt to scandalize their parents. We did it to our parents, and we didn't turn out so bad. But pop culture is way more extreme now. And something very destructive is being foisted on our kids via TV shows and movies, print and media ads, and on the racks in children's clothing stores. Styles for girls of all ages are moving in a very dangerous direction. So much of what's being sold is simply too short, too tight, too low cut, too peekaboo, too sexy for little girls. Yet there it all is. And girls want these styles. Man, do they want them. Because their friends wear them. And because too many little girls, tweens, and teens truly believe that their value as people is a direct function of how they look. It gets harder and harder for parents to carry out our prime objectives, keeping our kids safe and raising them to be compassionate, thoughtful, self-assured young adults. But the issue goes way beyond short shorts, crop tops, and G-strings marketed for tweens. It goes beyond TV shows and toys that program girls and boys to think and act and play and dream in the narrowest, most gender-specific ways. What's going on here in 21st century America is a war of values. On one side, parents doing their best to raise healthy young adults. And what are we up against? The marketing might of multi-billion dollar corporations. You probably don't need anyone to tell you who's winning. I'm Annie Fox for Family Confidential, Secrets of Successful Parenting. Today's show, So Sexy, So Soon. My guest today is Diane E. Levin, co-author of So Sexy, So Soon, The New Sexualized Childhood and What Parents Can Do to Protect Their Kids. Dr. Levin is a professor of education at Wheelock College in Boston. She also heads up a summer institute on media madness in children. Dr. Levin has written seven other books, including The War Play Dilemma, Teaching Young Children in Violent Times, and Remote Control Childhood. She speaks around the world on the impact of violence, media, and other societal issues on children, families, and schools. Welcome, Diane. Well, thank you, Annie. It's lovely to be with you. The first thing I want to say is thank you for writing this book, because I read an awful lot of parenting books in the work that I do and think about these issues a lot, but I have never had it brought so front and center so succinctly in a way that I think will be incredibly helpful to parents and teachers as well. So thank you. Let's get right into it because there's so much to talk about. The subtitle says it pretty well. The book is called So Sexy So Soon, The New Sexualized Childhood and What Parents Can Do to Protect Their Kids. When parents hear the word sexy, they go off in one place. And when kids use the word sexy, even very young children they might mean something very different. So can we talk a little bit about the use of the word and how you define it? Sexy is different from sex. Sexy is something that children are hearing as a word regularly and they're trying to figure it out. For young children, what they're learning about how they're supposed to look is really, really important. They learn it at younger ages probably than ever before. And girls learn that what they wear and what they buy and how they look determines their value. And 
having the right value means being sexy. In their own eyes, in the eyes of boys. Girls, how they judge themselves, how girls judge each other, and how boys learn to judge girls, absolutely. I mean, boys have another whole set of stressors that they're struggling with, with this kind of extreme gender division where how girls look determines so much of their value and where how boys being tough and macho and ready to fight is how they're judged and how their value is determined is having a profound effect on the development of both boys and girls and the relationships they're able to have with each other. And what I see coming out of this early childhood exposure to these sexualized images and media messages is a lot of dissatisfaction, angst, and stress about who I am, how I feel about myself, my Mm -hmm. worthiness, and all Mm -hmm. of that, that is crippling emotionally for girls and boys as well. I'm going to read from the top of chapter two, because I think this paragraph really encapsulates what your book is all about. The problem today isn't that our kids are learning about sex. The problem is what they're learning, the age at which they're learning it, and who is teaching them. Children get a very powerful and damaging kind of sex education from marketers and the popular culture. They learn to want products that help them to look and act like the characters and people they see in advertising, TV programs, and music videos and on the internet. They learn to judge themselves and others by how they look and what they can buy, not on deeper, more human and humane qualities. As parents who have other values and goals for our children, we have to compete with the power of multi-billion dollar industries. So it's this multi-billion dollar industry industry that parents and parents' values are competing with. I'm really glad to start by talking about that because it's so unfair what's going on today with parenting and even teaching with the teachers I work with. I mean, it's parenting and and teaching and anyone who's trying to work with kids has a harder time because of this multi-billion dollar industry that is trying to teach children things that go against almost everything we want them to learn. Children have two different compartments developing in their heads. One of them is the popular media commercial culture box that's giving them all kinds of messages about how they're supposed to look, how they're supposed to act, what's supposed to be important, even for young kids, how they play, um, and that buying is what makes you happy. And then the other box is the box of the societal compartment, which is all the things we think children should learn, those of us who care about them, to make them become happy, fulfilled, contributing members of society when they grow up. And right now, The pop culture compartment's getting bigger and bigger. The societal culture one is getting crowded out. And one way I think about it, there's almost no connection between the two compartments. It's like two separate different boxes in kids' heads where they don't get help processing the popular culture. They gradually develop their own culture that's so bound up in all those messages that it becomes harder and harder for parents to counteract. But the fact is, Often we start really reacting strongly to it when kids are tweens or teens, but it's beginning much younger. As you're describing these compartments, I think about how challenging it is often for educated adults to be watching things on TV and go, this is so weird. Right. We can differentiate between our own values and what's being thrown at us, but a child... And research shows that we don't fully differentiate. That's why advertising is so big in our lives, too. But we certainly have a lot more skills for differentiating than children do. Children think very differently from adults. They focus on appearance. They focus on the concrete, salient things they can see. Their thinking is like a slide rather than a movie. For instance, when a child of six sees an ad where it's a product that looks wonderful and exciting and there's a child playing with it and it looks like if and, you know, the child thinks, if I have that product, I'll be happy and excited too. They don't think about how the child on the ad's getting paid to look like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, they don't think about what went into that ad. I know teachers who do activities with kids that get them to talk about ads that lie. You know, sometimes they bought something and it didn't work the way the ad said mm-hmm. it would and to do writing about that. And the kinds of stories they come up with, you know, kids are really feel that they've been tricked, I mean, which is good to help them work on, but how many adults do? Yeah, when I, I'm thinking about those teachable moments that we as parents have so right. that you could actually sit down with your kid and see those smiling, happy 
see kids playing with this toy or that toy mm -hmm. and talk to your kid. Are these children really happy? Are these children actually really even playing with this toy? How did they get in front of the camera? Exactly. Or finding a toy you know your child has that's being advertised and you know your child played with it for 10 minutes and it was exciting and then they put it on the shelf because it got boring because it only did one thing. Mm -hmm. They become very boring quickly. So actually, you know, talking about kids' experiences or when a child points and say, I want this. And you see the child looks happy in the edge. You say, but isn't that just like this other thing we got? How do you think you'd use it differently? Mm -hmm. And you notice I'm not trying to just lecture to the child. I'm trying to help parents think about how to engage in conversation, how to hear kids' ideas right? so that they have a chance to have a voice, too, and feel like we're interested in their ideas, even if they don't agree with us. That's a very wonderful and useful model for parenting. Things got much, much worse, and children became this consumer group to be marketed to en masse with billions of dollars in the middle 80s. That's when children's television was deregulated. Let's talk about that and the history of what we're now dealing with. It's really important because other countries have dealt with it very differently, and yet we, as such a powerful force in media and marketing have really undermined efforts of many other countries to deal with this. Until the middle 80s, children's television was regulated by the Federal Communications Commission. What they did was have a limit on the number of advertising minutes there could be per hour on children's television. And the FCC ruled that if you marketed a whole line of toys, like all the Power Ranger toys, with a TV show, then the whole show became a commercial. You had a program-length commercial and you couldn't do it. As indeed it was a program-length commercial. <laughs> right. So with deregulation, within one year, something like eight of the ten best-selling toys had TV shows. And I'm guessing there were some very strong lobbying efforts. Yes, there were. And it was during the Reagan administration when getting rid of regulation was a huge push and very successful. Mm -hmm. The main networks that had children's programming departments fired their departments very quickly and started buying their programming from companies that made the toys and worked with other companies with licensing for all the other products and breakfast cereals and bed sheets and t-shirts and lunch boxes. And I hate to take the cynical point of view here, but um, it certainly seems to me as an educator that the bottom line was way more important in the heads of these people than the healthy development of kids. Well, it's not too hard to conclude that. And one way I think about them is similarly that they have the two compartments in their head, their compartment when they're with their families and they, you know, are caring parents and caring members of society. And then when they're at work and the bottom line is what they have to think about. And it's almost like they're two different people. Children are a whole marketing group now that they had not been before. And have been for a while. And because of the persuasive nature of children and the soft heartedness of parents. But I'd like to tell you that I worry about saying soft hearted because parents are told constantly, if you just said no, there wouldn't be a problem. And it's because you're wimpy and you don't set limits for your kid that we have this problem. And I've seen industry members memos that say this is how you argue when something you do is criticized. So there's a huge effort to put all the blame on parents. And so I work really, really, really hard to tell parents that it's not your fault. There's no way to do a perfect job in this situation, but we can learn ways to make it better. And that's what I've been trying to study. And when you talk about what parents are up against in this multi-billion dollar industry that's coming at them with the big guns, it's really difficult. I think it's really interesting. And I want to quote you from page 88, where you say children need help working out what they're being exposed to. I was disturbed when reading these anecdotal bits of your book, So Sexy So Soon, where kids' language reflecting behavior and language they're picking up at school from peers, where kids are faced with, exposed to, and in some cases dealing with these situations and content that is way beyond their years and how, in fact, do they process it? I want to have you respond to this part of the book. Early objectification of self and others becomes a part of objectified sexual relations as children get older. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area as of several weeks ago. There was a horrific gang rape that happened in, in Richmond High School campus and 
boys and young men involved in this crime were, in fact, videotaping what was going on. There were also people who were observing and not responding to the woman in need. Mm -hmm. And I was struck by your quote about objectifying sex yes. and and objectifying people so that this kind of behavior on some level in the minds of the perpetrators is okay. There are many, many issues that kind of come to play into helping us understand that. One is what I call compassion deficit disorder. Mm -hmm. And we certainly see that at work. Compassion deficit disorder is the fact that the popular culture is undermining children's development of the ability to empathize with others and to connect with others. Everyone agrees violence is bad. You can tell children violence is bad. The world may not be doing a good job dealing with it, but violence is bad. We need to figure out ways to solve our problems without hurting each other. That's a starting point for talking to children at any age. But sex isn't bad. And what the messages they're getting when they're young isn't sex, it's sexiness. And how do you sort out what's going on? And the aha experience was asking myself the question, well, what are we trying to teach children when they're young so when they grow up they can have caring, connected relationships in which sex is a part? Excellent question, really. And that, I realized, was the question that the book needed to address. What's going on now to undermine children's ability to learn how to have caring, connected relationships? And how will that affect them as they get older? And what can we do at the various ages of childhood, from young children through adolescence, to counteract that compassion deficit disorder and to promote the ability to have healthy relationships? Mm -hmm. And what you're talking about is the complete failure from that horrific rape is the complete failure of the developmental process to help children become those caring, connected individuals. Now, Lord of the Flies is an example of kids who get out of control when they're together and they just start living in one compartment, not both. But the fact is, when sex then becomes involved, it further undermines their ability to be fully functioning, mature, fulfilled adults. What's happening with sex is that when children are very young, it focuses on appearance, looking right. Increasingly, I've been hearing of four-year-olds on playgrounds fighting over who's going to get the sexy girl to go on a date as they pretend on the playground to go on dates. Mm -hmm. I've heard of you know seven-year-old boys looking at the halftime of a football game, talking about how the dancers are hot. Now, they don't totally understand what that means, but it's the beginning of thinking of bodies as objects. As girls see what they buy and how they look determining their value as objects, and most bullying and teasing between girls happens around not looking right, mm -hmm. kind of a complete truncation of what being human is. At the same time, we know pornography is huge. And um, we know boys by their early teen years, large proportions of boys have seen pornography. And so they're getting messages and lessons about sex that objectify sex itself, not just relationships. And so it's a very complicated picture, but there are many forces coming to play that are undermining kids' ability to learn how to empathize. Even since I've written So Sexy So Soon, I keep hearing stories that help me understand how it's escalating. It used to be seven-year-olds would fight about having, you know, dates on the playground and who was the sexiest. Now it's four-year-olds, but I heard a story that broke my heart when a seven-year-old who was just, who was overweight, went to get on the jungle gym on the playground and a boy on the jungle gym said, you're going to break it. And all the kids on the jungle gym started chanting, you're going to break it, you're going to break it, you're going to break it. And she went off crying. No one helped her, and now she won't go to school. Oh, that is heartbreaking. Now, I taught kids for many years. Those were not the kinds of things kids were mean to each other about in second grade. I see that there is the trickle-down effect here where kids younger and younger seem to be embodying what used to be mean kid behavior that you saw in middle school and in high school. Good point. And parents, I think, are giving mixed messages. I want to go back to the clothing, and it was just Halloween, and I read several articles about parents who were looking for what they thought were age-appropriate 
costume choices for their daughters and finding less and less to choose from and less and less to the liking of their four, five, and six-year-old girls. So they were getting pushback from their daughters. It seems to me that the whole notion of aspiring to be a little bit older and looking around the corner, that's quite normal and natural and healthy. Mm -hmm. But once again, when you talk about kids having trouble differentiating between what's coming in and those two boxes, which are pushing them into territories where they are not equipped in any way to process the information, puts them so at a disadvantage that they are in fact a little bit robotic in their response to it because it's not coming from any organic developmental place. It's like pasted on top of them. Boy, you've touched on several key issues. I've actually wrote a book 10 years ago called Remote Control Childhood. It's very much about this issue. It's not new. Just when you think 10 years ago, it couldn't get much worse. It's gotten much worse. The kinds of toys that are linked to TV shows and then Bratz dolls and the bling bling Barbies and the various kinds of toys that are marketed to girls and Disney Princess and Hannah Montana as well, all program kids into the narrowest possible range of behaviors and the most extreme gender divisions we could possibly have. More and more of kids' play is just imitation, not creative. Mm -hmm. They're more like robots imitating what they saw on the screen. They're not doing the kind of creative, imaginative play that's necessary for optimal development. Coupled with that are the things they're imitating are things that have to do with what I call age compression. It's kids doing things that older kids at younger and younger ages. Now, little girls always would want to dress up like their mothers. And when they had, you know, a dress up box and they put things on and they create the characters and do the things, it's very different than having all these programmed outfits. So you're absolutely right that it's a problem. And if parents just say, no, we're not going to get it, one, it's harder and harder to find other ones. Mm. But two, they will have a war in the house and we needed to think carefully about how do we deal with that alienation between ourselves and our children around dealing with and that's why thinking about the separated boxes and how to connect them is so important. I think there are conflicts within parents too. Right. When parents give the impression that it's cute when their four-year-old wiggles her hips and dances to some pop song in front of the relatives and that dad is feeling proud and giving his cute, sexy little girl praise for being pretty. What's the message the kids are getting? Is this okay or is this not okay? Well, it's not okay, but it's it's parents kind of in it in a way that they're not to blame for being in it when they're constantly getting messages that the way they dress their kids is so important. There's now t-shirts for boys like saying, I'm a chick magnet. Yeah. For four-month-olds. What is that about? Parents think it's cute. They don't Why think- do parents think it's cute? I <laughs> well, that's really, a good why? question. Okay, let me think about that. They think it's cute because at this point they know their baby doesn't get it. There have always been kind of these little sexual jokes that adults have gotten humor at, and they think this is one time they're having this sexual joke at the expense of their baby, and so isn't this cute? It gets parents into treating their children as objects. Yeah. How you dress your baby, if you saw some of the Halloween costumes for two-year-olds, both for boys and girls, they may not be as extreme as what you hear about, but for a two-year-old, you know, dressing in an outfit that looks like a prostitute or a boy, you know, being a super macho Batman man, you know, with a sword. I mean, it's telling kids lessons about who they are that they can understand, but for little girls, when it's appearance, Mm -hmm. parents should be valuing their kids for what they're doing, not how they look. And so often when it starts at this young age, you put a pretty dress on your three-year-old and the whole family sees her and says, oh, she's so pretty. And the little girl learns that's what people like. And gradually she understands more and more that she has to pay attention to how she looks. Marketers know what appeals to children and they use a big muscles for boys you know tough macho things girl those kind of sparkles capture girls attention boys start looking at and think the girls who have it are the coolest Mm -hmm. when they're three you started earlier by asking about how kids end up getting blamed they don't make sense of a lot of this and that's what ends up happening you know it makes perfect sense given what I know about child development that that little girl with the sparkles is going to think that makes her really special and so she needs it to be special because of how she thinks and how adults react right. she needs it and that there's nothing inherent in her 
that is sparkly. Right. She needs this right. facade. She needs this costume. Right. And kids don't think about what's inside easily. It's how things look. They're concrete thinkers. They focus on appearance. So they're especially vulnerable for those messages. I certainly agree, especially when you talk about how many hours kids are sitting there being consumed and entrenched in these messages. Well, it would certainly seem as a culture that this is what we want them to learn rather than offering some healthy counter messages from from the home. I really appreciate when you were talking about commercial culture versus the family culture. And I talk to parents a lot about the choices they make just in terms of saying we are turning off social digital media as we're having dinner together as a family. Right. That becomes a big deal. That's a choice. And you may get a whole lot of pushback from your 12, 14, or 16-year-old if you even suggest that texting is not allowed at the dinner table. But we know that over 50% of families have their TV sets on at dinner time more than 50% of the time. I didn't know that. <laughs> My goodness. That's from the Kaiser Family Foundation. The fact that now we're talking about what you're talking about and, you know, digital and, you know, handheld stuff, you just realize how that was only, you know, six or seven years ago that those figures were out. It's quite recent, Diana. And, and the idea of the images and the messages coming to very young children, and that informs their self-perception, their sense of who they are in relation to their peer group and where the value is placed on what is good, popular, attractive, etc. And then what I see then as the kids picking up on that foundation of messaging and then literally text messaging each other with their evaluations of who is in and who is out and yes. and all of that stuff, it becomes 24-7 an echo chamber, really. Absolutely, but I just heard a story that kind of shows where it's starting at age four, <laughs> how that kind of behavior that ends up becoming the texting. A little girl went to her four-year-old classroom and her mother, instead of using her Disney princess lunchbox, had washed the lunchbox, so she put it in a bag and the girl gets to school, and none of the girls with Disney lunchboxes will let her sit at the table with them. Okay, I, we need to stop right there, because then I'm thinking, okay, there are adults in this school environment where this exclusionary behavior is taking place. Yes, the teacher does deal with it, but it takes a while till she realizes it's going on till this little girl starts crying. No. You know, teachers don't see everything. I mean, there's an example in the book that's even more extreme, where the little boy at five says to a girl... I want to have sex with you in the play area. The teacher didn't hear it. The girl goes home and tells her parents. She knows somehow that's something provocative about that that's not okay. The parents go to school hysterical. The school has a zero tolerance policy and they're ready to suspend the boy. But the requirement is that he see the school counselor before he's suspended. He goes to the counselor and the counselor asks him what he wanted to do to the girl. And he bursts into tears finally. And he says, I liked her. I wanted to give her a kiss. This is a five-year-old. Now, when I taught kindergarten years ago, five-year-old boys didn't think about giving girls as kisses because they liked them. Mm -hmm. That wasn't how, you know, they played together because they liked them. You know, things have changed. That's such an example of adults reacting in a certain way. Absolutely. That really is harmful to the child. Not helpful at all. Traumatic. And so that hypervigilance that you talk about in the book and in this particular example, is something that we see as a response. See, we're doing something. We've got a zero tolerance policy on anything that has to do with violent or sexual behavior, but mm -hmm. it's not serving the child. It's not serving the school environment. It's teaching nothing positive. Right. It's a perfect example of keeping the boxes completely separate and thinking if you use power over kids, you'll solve the problem, yes. and instead they just go underground more. They were not there to help them make good decisions and learn how to do it, even if it's not always exactly what we want, as this five-year-old gets older. Instead of just thinking we can punish kids and put them in time out or suspend them, we need to connect with them and help them understand what's going on and what they're trying to figure out and influence the lessons they're learning. I think that's really important, especially as you said earlier, that fully functioning adults who are healthy, know how to create and maintain healthy relationships. Yes. And that whole 
process of learning about connecting intimately with trust, honesty, and respect is at the forefront of parenting objectives Mm -hmm. as you're raising your children. Children are not born being able to do that. They're very egocentric. They see the world as revolving around them. And that's not a negative statement. They assume you think the way I think. You know, if I want a ball and you have the ball and I take it from you because you're playing with it and I want to play with it, you know, and then you hit me. I just focus on you hit me. I don't focus on that I took the ball from you. I mean, I'm egocentric. I just think on how things affect me. And part of growing up is gradually learning to decenter more and more, learning the effects of your actions on others, learning to perspective take and empathize. That doesn't just happen naturally. And there's so many messages in the popular culture compartment that totally undercuts that starting from the objectification of self and other, all the violence kids see, linking of sex and violence, which in part makes the horrible rape you talked about, that contributes to to it happening as well. It's harder and harder to teach kids to empathize, and it's happening at a time kids need more of it from us, at a time when schools are shutting it down because of No Child Left Behind, where they're saying we have to spend more time teaching basic skills. We'll cancel recess when they hurt each other. It's great because we have more time to teach basic skills. But if kids are thinking about their relationships with each other and the problems they're having and how they've been picked on and teased, they're not going to focus very well on learning unless we help them deal with those other problems so that their energy is freed up to focus on the skills they're trying to teach in school. That's absolutely true. And even though it is also very true that the burden of responsibility for causing and perpetrating this whole problem falls squarely on the shoulders of the marketers Mm -hmm. and in the industries that are, are lining their pockets with money that they're getting after they so very adeptly target young children in these areas. I completely agree with that. But I also agree that there are things that parents can do. Absolutely. Starting from what are your objectives for your child when he or she becomes an adult in terms of their ability to be compassionate and caring partners. Mm -hmm. And as well as having those oasis times when you're absolutely turning off the media. But I think it would be an excellent time now for you to share with our listeners your review of what parents can do, because these are action steps and they're really great and very pragmatic. Thank you. And using all of these steps will help parents do a better job than they're currently doing. And even if they're doing some of them, hopefully they'll hear others that they can add to their repertoire. What I'm going to suggest will make it better than it otherwise would be. It will not solve the problem fully until we find ways to change things. Parents shouldn't need a Ph.D. in uh, child development to raise their kids. And in fact, I had a Ph.D. and it was really hard coping with these things with my son. Diane, I'm going to read this 11-point list of things parents can do. And if you wouldn't mind, just comment on each one. One. Protect children as much as possible from exposure to sexual imagery and related content in the media and popular culture. That means thinking about what toys they buy their kids and trying to avoid logos and trying to avoid the toys that are highly gender stereotypes so that it only focus on appearance for girls and fighting for boys, giving them more open-ended products, but also helping them think about setting rules and routines for screen time. The American Academy of Pediatrics says no screen time for children under age two. But once you start letting it in, if you have routines and rules, it's not what most parents say happens. It just creeps in more and more and more. And when, when a rule becomes a problem, then you can start negotiating. And maybe your child's now a year older and you do let them watch a different show. But having control and having it not be a constant battle is one way to keep peace in the family and keep kids in charge of their own lives. There's another group that I'm very involved with that actually prepares a guide on choosing toys for children and another one on dealing with the media. Teachers Resisting Unhealthy Children's Entertainment and the website is T-R-U-C-E, truceteachers.org. Two. Learn about the media and popular culture in your child's life. Popular TV programs, movies, video and computer games, fashion, celebrities. To know yourself what the media and popular culture in your child's life is. What are the fashions? Who are the celebrities? What are the things they're talking about? So you know more about what's in that pop culture compartment. So when it comes up, you can talk about it. You can act interested in it, even if you're not. And that you can really... um, 
know enough so that you can see how it's influencing your kids so you can talk about it. Watching the shows, looking at the magazines, talking to them. Three. Get beyond the just say no approach. Parents are told over and over again to just say no, and that will solve the problem, and it won't. And we have you know, 12 reasons why just saying no isn't enough in the book. Things like it cuts you off from t- being able to talk to your kids about it. They just go underground. You can't teach them as much. They have to rely on their friends to learn things instead of you teaching them. You can end up having an endless battle in the family. Kids feel very disempowered, and you have a constant war, so it really undermines your relationship at a time when you want it, and it's really important to have connective relations with your kids where you can work out the problem. So just saying no, it doesn't mean we never say no, but when we do say no, it's a whole process we go through to get there. It's not just saying no. Four, establish safe channels for talking about sexual development and related issues with children, starting when they are very young. Sometimes that's hard, but so that we know what they're seeing, they'll talk to us about what they're seeing, and this connects to number five. Five, make age-appropriate give-and-take conversations about sexualization of childhood issues an essential part of your relationship with your child. So that a child really can come home in the case of, of one boy at age seven and said to his parents when he'd already, they'd, he'd already asked about sex because an aunt had had a baby. Um, so he knew a little bit about where babies came from. It wasn't sex as the issue, but he asked his parents, is sexy sex? And they could talk about that, and it turned out all the boys were calling one of the girls on the playground sexy. And he was really confused about what it meant, and that he could go to his parents and ask, is every parent's, that should be every parent's best dream, that we want kids to come to us and and feel that it's safe. And even if they ask us something, like the boy who came home and said he saw pornography on the internet, and um, was clearly worried and upset about it. He could talk to his parents, and he knew they weren't going to lock him up for a month the way the boy whose parents found out about the pornography did. So staying connected, learning how to talk about it, even though it's hard, and we don't always know what to say, so the kids know they have a safe place to come. As they get older and things get more extreme and stressful and potentially dangerous, if we're there, it's going to help. Six, encourage children to use play, art, and writing to process sexual images and other media messages they see. So much of what's happening now is kids are glued to screens, and then when they are not on the screen, they have toys that say, when you play, you imitate what you've seen, or but it undermines them really becoming good players where they can kind of pretend they're grown up if that's what they're interested in rather than just imitating being a brat doll. Right. So helping kids become good players and use their art or use writing as they get older to kind of tell stories and, and use their imaginations and be creative and process. It's a kind of therapeutic process. It helps them work out meaning. And it's not therapy, but it helps when the more kids understand instead of being confused, the more work going to learn about what they understand and the more we're going to be able to help them. I was just thinking also on that one, not just in processing the media messages they're seeing, but also just to give them the time to dream. When you tell them that you are in fact as a family limiting the amount of screen time, you have to offer them creative alternatives. Absolutely. That's really crucial that parents say, but what are they going to do when I'm making dinner if the screen isn't on? And they'll kill each other and the parent is right. We need to help kids think about it. In my home, we had PTVT, post-TV trauma. (laughs) I knew when we turned off the television, it was a really hard time for my son because I noticed that's when we had lots of our family fights. Mm -hmm. And so I started talking to him about what can we do when we turn it off so you end up don't feeling so grumpy. I think it's hard to figure out what to do when we turn it off. And he said, yes, and we worked on it. You know, helping children not seeing it as just their job and if they say they're bored saying yeah well it is hard it is boring when you turn off the set or you turn off the the computer let's think about what you can do when that happens that's good the more tv and screen time kids have the more they need because the harder it is for them to figure out what to do absolutely seven counteract the narrow stereotypes of boys and girls that are so prevalent in media and commercial culture. We can do a lot by encouraging girls to do things that are a little boyish, having boys that they can play with when they're young so they have friends who are boys. I just talked to a teacher yesterday who has a curriculum going in her classroom where she's trying to pair up things girls are really good at and things boys are really good at and getting them to interact more so that they're both motivated. Because, for instance, she found... 
the boys were just really hostile about having girls play in the blocks and the girls weren't interested in going there anyway. So she ended up having um, pairing up what the girls were interested in at that point, which was um, the hospital they had set up. And she set up a hospital in the block area. And now the girls and the boys are playing together more. Eight, counteract compassion deficit disorder by helping children learn how to have positive and caring relationships. So it means when children do do something mean to each other, when children do have a conflict, we don't just use time out. We don't just punish them. We don't just make them feel guilty. We really help them think about, let's look at what happened And let's think about what we can do to solve this problem so you're both happy and not mad at each other. Mm -hmm. And so one child may say, well, I want this. And another may say, I want that. And you think about, well, let's think about what you do. Can you share the toy? No, I want to use it myself. Well, okay, what if you use it first and then the other child uses it after lunch so that you help them figure out ways they can do things that take each other's points of view into account. I mean, we talk a lot about that in the book and in other other writing, but thinking about how schools can do that more and teach parents demand that of schools more, that they really start developing a social curriculum. Nine. When conflicts arise between you and your child about sexuality and related issues, seek mutually agreeable solutions. So in the case of one family, a daughter was going to her first school dance with boys and girls and she wanted to go shopping to buy a new dress and the mother was horrified at the dresses the daughter wanted because they were so sexy so the daughter pointed to a dress that she wanted and said and the mother said well tell me what you like about it and then she said to the daughter well let me tell you what I worry about and it was all the sexiness and then she said now here's a dress that I would want to choose I'll tell you what I like about it Mm -hmm. and you tell me what you don't like about it And then it was, let's try to find a dress that's in between. Now, it takes a lot of work, and it puts more demands on parents. But I will tell you, parents contact me after they have such conversations and feel so much less guilty and feel so much better that they end up spending less time after a while on all the other things they were dealing with that made them feel so bad. Now, I'll tell you, one family did this, and they said the father went to pick the girl up from the dance, and she was wearing her friend's dress. Oh, (laughs) So it's not as if everything works magically, but that conversation is really important that she has her mother's voice in her head when she's shopping and gradually it gets there. And as she gets older, it'll be there more and more. And then, you know, the father could say, well, I'm going to ground you for a month for doing that. But what this family did was say, you know, we worked on it so hard. We thought we worked it out. We need to figure out a way to deal with this so you're not sneaking around, Mm -hmm. but so you're happy and we're happy too. And hopefully the parents wouldn't have chosen a dress that would be so out of sight. But it means parents end up making decisions they aren't necessarily their first choice. Yeah. Compromise, huh? Compromise. But kids are learning so much from that discussion. It's worth the compromise. I would definitely agree. And and I think that what the mom did in the store was brilliantly creative. Having those dialogues impacts kids and helps them learn to think. Yes. And those voices are in their heads. When I learned to do that with my son, I didn't have a daughter. I could hear him arguing with his friends about things that sounded like my voice, maybe two years after the argument. So it was very good. And we had the same kind of discussions around movies he saw. Mm -hmm. The first violent movie he saw was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And it was because every other boy in his class had seen it, and the expert in his class invited him to go with him. And I decided, and you know, in talking to my son about how much he wanted to go, it seemed like it was time for him to be able to do it. And the rule had to change. But I went with him, and when we came out, my good friend who I worked with this on asked him, so what did you think of the movie? And he said, my mom came out and said she had a stomach ache and couldn't eat dinner. But I loved it. It was wonderful. (laughs) And I felt good and bad, you know, what I call blend your feelings. Mm. But I was glad he could say what he thought, even if it wasn't what I thought. But my friend could say, so what gave your mom a stomach ache? And he he could repeat it all. He could identify. She didn't like this, and she didn't like that, and she didn't like this. And then she said, well, what did you love? And he could talk about it. So he had both voices in his head. And I think that was the best start I could possibly have at that point. I would have rather we didn't have to deal with the movie but we did. 10. Share your values and concerns with other caring adults, your friends and relatives, and the parents of your children's friends. 
that so works against what industry is trying to do. The more isolated parents are, the more they struggle themselves, the more power industry has in their marketing. The more parents get together and say, no, we're not going to do this. We're going to work together on that. The better it's going to be. My favorite example was a school where a mother was really unhappy when her daughter went to a high school musical birthday party at a five-year-old's house. And they learned how to do the sexy dances as the entertainment at the party. The mother kind of talked to the teacher. The school ended up writing a letter that they now use every year when children are entering kindergarten about interesting kinds of parties they can do that are more creative and that allow kids to kind of not worry about buying things. And then they make suggestions for the kinds of birthday presents that avoid getting into competition around logos. And I thought that was really impressive. Now, some parents may say, well, this isn't the school's right. Mm -hmm. The school has to build a climate where parents and teachers work together when you know working together with other adults schools need to play a bigger role in helping parents with this 11 ask your child's school to take seriously its vital role in working with children and families to help counteract the harm caused by the sexualization of childhood and that means comprehensive sex education at the appropriate age mm -hmm. it means that younger ages having a social curriculum where the little girl on the jungle gym those kinds of events on the playground are dealt with as something all the kids are going to learn from and think about how to deal with how they deal with bystander behavior so that they think about how they can help a child so having a kind of social growth curriculum that's appropriate to the age of the child where sex education comes in is crucial, but it's also how they deal with all the kinds of issues that come in. And even having curriculum activities where kids are writing about the rules for media they have at their house and their favorite movie. They would do much better at writing if they did use the things they were so interested in, but it would also provide an opportunity for teachers to guide and to, to work with families and children around these issues. This is a really wonderful list. We all have to work to try to change society in whatever way we can to make it easier for parents to do their job. And that means it's complaining at a store when there's a, something at the checkout line that you don't like. It means when your child gets a toy that breaks immediately, it looks like it was going to be fun taking it back to the store. One organization's campaign for a commercial free childhood has tons of information for your listeners to think about, I can do this or I can do that. And that website is Commercial Free Childhood. Dot org. Great. Thank you for that, Diane. Where can people find out more about your work? Well, on the website at SoSexySoSoon.com, there's actual suggestions for how to deal with some of these and many other resources to get ideas of ways to deal with various issues that might come up. I'm about to begin my own blog, my website, which is Diane11.com. Great. Thank you so much for being with us today, Diane. I think, as I said from the beginning, this book has revolutionized my thinking about these issues in childhood and the impact on the healthy development of our kids. The title of the book is So Sexy So Soon, The New Sexualized Childhood and What Parents Can Do to Protect Their Kids. My guest has been Diane E. Levin. And Diane, great work. I look forward to reading your blog and keeping up with all the comments that you have as our culture evolves and how we can push back against some of this negativity. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks again, Diane. This is Annie Fox for Family Confidential. To learn more about my work with tweens, teens, and parents, check out AnnieFox.com. And join me next time when I'll talk with Amalia Starr about her new memoir, Raising Brandon, Creating a Path to Independence for Your Adult Kid with Autism and Special Needs. Till then, happy parenting! Mm -hmm.